This is another Eye Raw podcast. Animal photojournalism, by definition, encourages swift and necessary change on behalf of the beings in the frame. We're making no bones about it. This is why we're here. Welcome back to The Animal Turn, everyone. This is season six, where we're focusing in on animals and politics. And today, in episode seven, I've got an awesome guest for you. I'm speaking to none other than Joanne MacArthur, and we're speaking about animal photojournalism and why it's important for politics. And we don't spend, I think, a long time on unpacking politics necessarily, but I think throughout the conversation, you will definitely pick up on and understand why animal photojournalism is an important part of political change for animals and of advocacy. So it was a delightful conversation. Joanne is just awesome and really, really fun to talk to. But let me tell you a little bit about her. If you haven't seen Joanne's work, she's an award-winning photojournalist, sought-after speaker, photo editor, and the founder of We Animals Media. And if you haven't looked at We Animals Media, dare I say, stop listening to the podcast right now and Google We Animals Media. It is awesome. Joanne has visited over 60 countries to document our complex relationships with animals. Joanne is the author of three books, one, We Animals, the second, Captive, and the third, Hidden, Animals in the Anthropocene. Joanne was also the subject of Canadian filmmaker Liz Marshall's acclaimed Canadian documentary, The Ghosts in Our Machine. Joanne's photographs have received accolades from Wildlife Photographer of the Year, Nature Photographer of the Year, Big Picture, Picture of the Year International, the Global Peace Award, and others. She has been a visiting scholar at the University of British Columbia and Denver University, and in 2020, Joanne was a jury member for World Press Photo. She comes from Toronto, and she's done a lot of advocacy work and photojournalism in Canada, but she's done photojournalism across the world, visiting at least 60 different countries. Throughout the episode today, we speak about some of her experiences working as an animal photojournalist, as well as why she thinks it's so significant that people pick up cameras and document animals' lives. Joanne, welcome to the Animal Turn podcast. I'm very excited to have you on. I'm a huge fan of your work. I've followed your photos for a long, long time. And what you've done with We Animals Media is really, I think, revolutionary. So when I was planning this season, thinking about animals and politics, a lot of the kind of usual concepts came up and really important concepts, concepts like politics, legitimacy, sovereignty. But the more I kind of thought about it, I don't know, the more I felt like there needs to be something in here about photojournalism and the work you do. So I'm, I'm really hoping that we can speak a bit about why the work of We Animals Media and the kind of animal photojournalism is politically important, because I think there's a, there's a story there. But before we jump into that, tell me a little bit about you. How did you, how did you become a photographer? How did, this, how did, how did you end up with, with a camera in your hand? Mm, following my nose following the things that inspired me. And from a young age, I was really moved by conflict photography. And before I had any concept of photographing animals in the way that I do, I saw that conflict photography could change minds and in, and in fact, influence history, influence current affairs and change widespread narratives on war and humanitarian crises and so on. And so initially I thought that's what I want to do. Also, I'm a real, really like a hands-on person, not, not someone who ever did well in school, you know, always had a hard time concentrating. And there's really something about being a photojournalist and being in the moment really satisfies your curiosity on a moment by moment basis. It's where I feel really engaged in the world and I lose myself. And I love that. And so not only do I have this personal satisfaction around it, but I can help change things and, uh, you know, in the long term, improve the lives of others by by documenting their lives. And so it was the conflict photography interest that led to the conflict with animals. So did you study photography? Did you go to or did you just kind of train yourself on, on how to take awesome photos? I was a a geography and English literature major, and as an elective, I took a black and white printing course. 
and on day on class two, I was sold. It's it's funny those moments in life where you're sure of something, even though you have very little experience with it. It doesn't happen often, but it happened for me in in photography. And I thought this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. It's just so exciting, and it's so endlessly influential. And you're putting yourself in a position of learning every time you're in the field, be it street photography or conflict or APJ, animal photojournalism. And yeah, so I, I finished my degrees, but uh, was pursuing internships and assisting other photographers. And then after a couple of years, one of the photographers I assisted said, Joe, you probably need to break out on your own now. You're literally ripping the camera out of my hands to do it yourself. <laughs> like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> what kind of work were you covering as an intern? Oh, I mean, every kind of work that teaches you how to use a camera and how to use lighting and how to run a business. And, and that's another interesting part about We Animals Media is that it's, it is a business and there's a lot that goes into it. So what began as Girl with Camera is, is now an international NGO and photo agency in the service always really of, of animals and of improving the lives of others and you know, being strategic. I realized that we could do a lot more if, there were, if it was more than me. And of course, there were a couple of other people doing very serious professional animal photojournalism, but it didn't have a name yet. And there wasn't so much of a concerted effort. So I think I'm getting a little ahead of myself here and maybe we'll get into that. No, that's totally, that's totally fine. Because, so you said animal photojournalism, like it didn't have a name, so it wasn't really a thing, which is quite interesting because when you think about photos, I think we've got relatively, you know, you think about photos and animals, maybe you're thinking about like lions in the savannah or or like polar bears on ice caps. You know, you've got very kind of specific images that you have in mind when you think about animals in photos, and they're often tourism images or, you know, conservation images. But what you do at We Animals Media is very different. So so maybe you could tell us what is what is animal photojournalism? Yes, it is quite different from what you've just mentioned and the animals you've mentioned. We're quite comfortable looking at charismatic animals. National Geographic has taught us to welcome visuals of animals on the savanna, for example, into our homes. We know that they have a plight, but we're not afraid of it. So we're not afraid of wildlife photography. It's not too controversial for us. And same with conservation photography as well. And then there are, you know, there's like pet portraiture, images of companion animals, and all of these ways that we photograph animals that feel acceptable to us. But there are a lot of animals who go completely unseen in the world, but we have a very close relationship with them, much closer than the animals on the, on the savanna. And, and they are the animals that we wear and the animals we eat animals who are used in labs. We use medicine that's been tested on them. And, you know, even the animals that are a little more visible, those who are used in entertainment, rodeos, zoos, circuses, bullfights, and and so on. Now, it's a lot more on, it's a lot less comfortable for us to, to look at these animals because we have a direct relationship in like the quality of their lives or the abject suffering and cruelty inflicted on them. And that is because of us. And so we certainly have a lot of defenses when it comes to looking at these animals, confronting their lives. These images ask questions of us. These images are a mirror, really. If I show you an image of a chicken, a layer hen in a factory farm in a cage stuffed into a cage, and she can't even spread her wings, we might, there might be part of us that cares about that individual the way we might care about other animals but but it, it it calls upon us to like think about our egg eating for example and our defenses go up and it makes it very difficult for people to actually look at the images and stay with the images and contemplate the images so it's quite an uphill battle actually this animal photojournalism that we've coined yeah because i mean it's, it's really interesting because it makes me think now you you drew a parallel or at least kind of your your backstory is one of trying to get into kind of conflict photography and finding yourself in animal animal photojournalism. And both are really quite violent. 
But do you kind of think that there's a similar kind of defensiveness when it comes to war photography? Do you, do you, does the public, is the public as readily accepting of the kind of violence that they see in conflict images? Um, you know, of course, we've got histories with, like the Vietnam photography completely changed the outcome of that, that war and the ways in which the American public understood that conflict. But do you think that that's changed over time? Mm, I think that it remains easier to look at uh, humanitarian conflicts and war photographer because for the war photography, because for the most part, we're looking at something happening, quote unquote, over there. Of course, e economies tie us and bind us all, but nevertheless, we still have this geographical sense of like, that's over there, or that's a minority population, or we are better than them for some reason or another. Yeah. And I, I also think that, so there's an otherness, but also we, so we may not also feel directly responsible for the suffering of, of others. If there's, you know, a war happening, I keep saying quote unquote over there, I'm doing like the air quotes, but we can also do things like volunteer and donate to these causes. And that makes us feel good. And it should, and, and we should do, we should do everything that we can to help humans in conflict. But it is really less, fundamentally, it is less personal than looking at the animals who are involved in our, our daily lives that we're causing direct suffering to. This makes me think a bit of uh, Dinesh Wadiwell's kind of idea of the, the war against animals, because I mean, I, I get your point. If you're not a, a part of a specific conflict situation and it's some a place other than where you are, it's easy to kind of think that you're removed from that. But kind of meat eating is global. Wearing of animals is everywhere. So it's a lot more dispersed. And I understand the kind of proclivity to want to turn away from those images. But if there is this kind of will to turn away from images that show this kind of exploitation, and you say you're fighting an uphill battle. How do you how do you win that battle? How do you make people see the image when they are inundated with with images? Mm. Well, you are asking the question that we ask ourselves, we animals media, every single day, and that's the question that many types of activists are asking themselves: how to get people to not turn away, whether you're in the courtroom or in the schoolroom, how to get people to engage and. I think that there are roots that need to be examined and tackled. I mean, I could talk about looking at images, which actually is something quite superficial and how to get people to look at images. But why are we so defensive? Why won't we look? Well, it's because of our culture and traditions. And I think a different kind of education is needed for us globally, one in which that we are more curious and more open and more social and more socially responsible. And those haven't typically been a focus in education. So before we look at difficult images, we need like some internal groundwork that needs to, to, be, to be taught. But we're not, we're not there. <laughs> I, I really do think your images, though, kind of compel people to think differently, perhaps because I do think that there's a way in which some Im images can objectify animals and possibly objectify animals' violence, right? But there's some, in, in many of the photographs that are taken by We Animals Media, I find that there's a tendency of kind of really trying to understand the animal in the photograph. So you're positioning oftentimes, whether it's one animal or, or many animals, you're trying to position their experience, right? It's not just some sort of like abject violence or that's detached. Oftentimes you've got really kind of personal, I think, framing where you're seeing a specific cow in a transport trailer, their eye poking out, for example. And it's done with really high quality. It's not just kind of a snapshot, which really grabs, I think, attention and compels, at least me, it compels me to really stop and think about that cow or that pig. And and yeah, maybe that's part of that education, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you, you said that and you've noticed that because really what we are trying to do in animal photojournalism is is show the individual, but show the context as well. I find a lot of animal pictures not very useful to the animals historically, especially portraiture, especially images that are so clearly taken for our enjoyment. And yeah, so APJ, Animal Photojournalism, I'll probably continue to use the acronym, uh, is 
is to yeah show the individual and show the context. So we want to show the bars, the darkness, the the feces they're standing on, the dead bodies of cage mates, and and so on. The the realities of how they're living and how they are dying. And and so we do go to slaughterhouses as well. We do follow them as they go to slaughter. You mentioned the trucks. People don't think about transport when they think about eating animals, if they think about the animals at all. But they might think of the animals on a farm, probably something cleaner and nicer than is the reality. And they certainly don't think about the, the kilometers and the miles that are put in the deaths on the trucks, the temperature, be they really, be it really hot or cold and so on. So yes, documenting the experiences of these hidden animals, as we call them. How do you get access to these spaces? Ah, access. <laughs> <laughs> any, any way we can, which is unpleasant to me. What I mean is having to do things surreptitiously, having to be undercover, having to sneak in at night. These are really unpleasant things for all of us because they're dangerous and scary. We're putting ourselves at financial risk, legal risk, psychological risk. It would be nice if every animal industry was open to, if not the public, then to, to cameras. But they aren't because when people see the conditions in which we keep animals, they're generally really unhappy. And then the industry has to has to do a cleanup job and use the use the usual lines like oh it's it's just one bad apple they're not all like this and so on so to access back to your question about access often this work is done at night some people say it's breaking and breaking and entering but i have never broken anything <laughs> no, i'm just entering the door was unlocked and in fact it's generally what i do i go through doors that are unlocked go in and for the most part just document things as they are and leave without a trace we've spoken about like biosecurity before i spoke to camille lubchuk actually in the the previous season that was focused on biosecurity about you know, animal farm activism. And one of the things she mentioned was how biosecurity is often used as a as a mechanism to prevent activists or journalists from entering these spaces. Because I, I guess you, you mentioned the legal ramifications. If you were to be found, even if you didn't break anything, even if you didn't disturb anything, your mere presence could be called a violation for, especially if these are food animals, as like a biosecurity threat, right? Yeah, well, they will they will say that we're causing every kind of, of threat, not just the biosecurity. And in recent years, I would say everyone who goes into farms wears biohazard suits and gets fully equipped from, you know, the booties to the gloves to the full the full suit. I don't think that, you know, regular staff are doing that on the day to day. So yeah, they'll throw that at us. And I suppose you and Camille talked about ag gag and all of the issues to the extent that people like me can't even in some states and provinces photograph a farm from public property. Like we can't stand from the road with a long lens. Yeah, we've spoken about ag gag laws uh, previously on the podcast, both with Siobhan O'Sullivan and with Camille Lubchik, kind of comparing Australia and 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 Canada and the US came up in, in these episodes as well as being really quite restrictive in terms of allowing access for public insights, for public viewing. Have you found those same kind of restrictions in access to the ways in which animals are used in other countries? Or is this primarily a kind of, I don't know, I guess, English speaking country tendency? Well, first, a shout out to, to Siobhan, a wonderful person. An amazing person. An amazing person. And it's very sad for all of us and the animals that she's no longer with us. So grateful for her influence over the years. And she was such a giver, like right until, even, even once she knew she had cancer, she put in place provisions to make sure that money was going towards assisting animals and helping animal study scholars. That kind of foresight is, and, and just, I don't know, humility and, and devotion is really, it's beautiful. Yeah. Oh, thanks for saying that. I want everyone to know about her and her legacy. Okay, wait, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> The question was uh, differences in access. Have you kind of seen uh, through all the different countries you've gone to? The reason I ask about this difference in access is I, I fear sometimes we have this idea that, especially you know, with, with COVID-19 happening, people have this idea that, oh, wet markets in China or in Asia somewhere are far worse than 
perhaps what farming is in Western countries. But I wonder if we just kind of have a more of an imagination of what farming and animal treatment is like in Asia, because it's more visible, I suppose. Mm. Yeah, I, part of why I've traveled so much is because I have wanted to show that systems are very similar across the world. And, and you're right, some of these uh, farming practices and wet markets or systems are just more visible. And, and then you combine that with racism and you've just got like this nasty hot pot brewing of nimbyism and not taking any responsibility. Like wherever we are, we, we assume that our practices are, are better than in other places. Certainly we see that in Canada and like the Scandinavian countries where people assume everything is just rosy and we have, you know, the best possible animal welfare laws and so on. But I go out of my way to show that that's not a fact. And I do like to remind people that we have some of the most antiquated transport laws in the world. And we also club baby seals and so on. So we shouldn't feel too proud. So back to access, though, it it really does depend on the province, the state or the country. You really have to get an idea of where you're working and what the consequences will be. Some countries are less violent than others. In some countries, you're taking your life into your hands when you go into onto a farm. The U.S. is is one of those countries. And there are countries all over the world that are like that. You could get killed for trespassing. You, you could get beaten up very, very badly. Some countries feel a little safer. You're never fully safe, that's for sure. But if you get caught and detained, you might just be held at a police station for a couple of hours. In other cases, you might be held indefinitely. And I'm still not speaking about this experience in detail yet, but last year I had to flee a country. I had to, I had to flee a country. Many lawyers got involved and I was in a lot of danger. I was, you know, ended up in the wrong place at the wrong time. Despite all my experience, it happens. It happens even to like very, very experienced conflict photographers. You just all of a sudden things change quickly and you're in danger. I recommend anyone who's interested in conflict photography and photojournalism to read Lindsay Adario's biography. It's called It's What I Do. And she had she's been abducted twice. Yeah, incredible that she made it through both times. But yeah, I, I had to flee a country last year be in a country where it's it's illegal to come in as a journalist. Like what? Yeah. And I I, I went in as a tourist, but I was also taking pictures and then wrong place, wrong time. And I was in some hot water. And that took some some time to recover from. <laughs> I'm sure that you come into several conflict situations where you have to kind of use skills of persuasion and de-escalation to to kind of get out of places and spaces. But fleeing a country, I imagine, is terrifying. It was awful. Wow. So, and I know that you've mentioned when even on, so you've got a page kind of dedicated to defining animal photojournalism. And one of the things you mentioned on that page is that a lot of people who do this type of work suffer from post-traumatic stress syndrome. And I assume that this is not only because you're fleeing or get caught up in conflicts, interpersonal conflict situations yourselves, but the work is really hard. You know, I, I know I imagine that people that do this work are pretty empathetic towards animals. They care about animals. So when you're photographing, I met like, how do you, how do you deal with the emotional strain of being in these places and encountering animals that are in some of the worst conditions? It does take a certain kind of personality. And I I guess I don't really have a definition (laughs) for that personality. You meant it, you mentioned empathy. That's true. You have to be someone who feels, you know, adventurous and nimble and like dogged. (laughs) It is, it is very traumatic work. Yes, it's traumatic to have to flee a country, but it's more traumatic to face animals that you can't help. And It's also why people don't stick with APJ for very long. And in fact, it's why people don't stick with animal photo, uh, sorry, animal advocacy, animal rights work for very long, because it's exhausting and change is slow. And you you make some progress, you know, two steps forward, three steps back, sometimes with laws. So it's a very tiring place to be. But there are a lot more human rights advocates than there are animal rights advocates. And there are a lot more environmental advocates than there are animal rights activists. Excuse me. 
I'm so, I'm so happy I'm not the only one. Like I know I'm the host of a podcast, but I perpetually stumble on words. <laughs> That was great. <laughs> so, you know, like, but you've got the smashing of human and animal words. Yes. It's, it's all good. <laughs> but my point was that the animals really need us to stick around because there are so few of us. They need us animal advocates to mentor and nurture each other and ourselves. Have you ever intervened on behalf of an animal? Like, I know that this is like one of those golden rules in, in journalism. So my, my undergrad degree was in journalism a, a little while ago. And I know that there was always this kind of idea of neutrality and don't intervene. And, and that it was kind of always this tension point in journalism, because you might be faced with, I think, what are really quite personal ethical dilemmas. And maybe it's actually imperative that you intervene, even if it flies in the face of your journalistic integrity, whatever whatever that is. Have you felt the need or have you ever intervened? I mean, like, nope, I'm not just standing behind the camera now. I'm taking this chicken and running. Yes. Yes, I have. But I, I love, there's a lot to unpack here. And I love that you mentioned journalistic integrity because there are certain rules that have been followed for decades, but they need to change and evolve. The conversation needs to broaden. The conversation used to be, for example, with war photographers, I think it was Jill Perez who was photographing the aftermath of Darfur and he repositioned a skull that was on the ground. He turned it a little bit so that he was going to make a better picture. I think that's okay, but it was major controversy. You want to create an image that reaches people and affects people. And so, yes, he tampered with the scene, but did it have ill effect to a room full of bones? Not really. Now, wasn't there a similar controversy with, was a Carter's photo with the Kwashioko child and the vulture and he cropped it so that you couldn't see the child clinic that was in the distance. So it kind of gave this image, gave this visual image of, you know, a lone child and a vulture. And it was a very powerful image, but I know that he suffered quite a bit of retaliation for that cropping. I've seen a few versions of it. So he may have had retaliation for cropping of one of them, but there are other images that are just as compelling of that very same scene. And yeah, did he need to crop out a need clinic in the background? Did he, yeah, he, he suffered tremendously from his, from his photojournalism. Did he end his life? Yeah, from what I recall, he committed suicide from just from the, the kind of pressure and, and just, I think a lot of moral moralizing about what he should have and could have done. And yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm sidetracking us from the original kind of question about whether, whether, you know, it's appropriate or not to intervene. But I think this, this is kind of part of that, that conversation, right? Yeah, I jumped right into this, like how ethics and journalism, the conversation needs to broaden. And so tampering, you could say that I'm tampering if I'm taking, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe those are, those are two different issues, but about, about journalistic integrity, also for decades, there's just been this, this mantra of objectivity and yes, to a degree, but also any journalist undertakes a story because they care about it and quite often because they want to usher change. And so animal photojournalism, by definition, encourages swift and necessary change on behalf of the beings in the frame. We're making no bones about it. This is why we're here. So that, that part of the definition really thrills me. And I, I hope that it'll continue to be discussed in photojournalistic and journalistic circles. I think it's important and interesting. But about, about taking animals, I have photographed open rescues. People go in and, and take animals. And I myself have taken an animal. I was leaving a rabbit farm. And what we always do when we leave farms, whatever farm it is, is we look inside the dumpster. And it's just like literal carnage. And, you know, people need to see that side of, of factory farming as well. And so we photograph inside the dumpster. But I hate to say that often there are living animals in the dumpster who are piled on the bodies of others who are almost dead and were just thrown out. And so you also look in the dumpster so that you can liberate an animal who is dying in there. And, and I did that in Spain and all of these rabbits Hundreds of rabbits were in clear plastic bags. We could see inside them. And I could see this little rabbit that when we opened the door to the bin, 
they reacted to the light and they nestled deeper into the bodies of, of other animals. So we opened the plastic bag and we struggled to release this tiny, tiny little rabbit. And he was so small, he fit in a little Tupperware. So we took the lid off the Tupperware and we put a scarf in there and put some grass in there and brought him directly to a vet. Now I could be, and the people I was with, you know, we could be charged with trespassing and theft and there would be serious consequences for people like us who are doing the only compassionate thing as far as I can see. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think we use the word taking, but I know that increasingly now there's kind of the right to the right to rescue, right? So the right to save. And I think I think like journalism is a is a profession and it requires it requires a certain pursuit towards objectivity. I think not that objectivity is ever achievable, but I think the idea of trying to give a sense of a scene is part of of the idea of journalism, even though the idea of objectivity is an illusion. But I think that for that rabbit, you saved that rabbit's whole world, right? Like journalism integrity, be damned for that rabbit. That rabbit doesn't care about journalism integrity. That rabbit lives. So the, the stakes are obviously much higher for, for that rabbit. But obviously some journalists, I imagine, would not be too thrilled with my assessment there. I mean, the, the scene you paint of opening up these dumpsters, I know one of the images on the website is one of just piglets, dead piglets and also what look like innards of other animals all just meshed together and when you see that versus the kind of sterilized clean cuts of meat in supermarkets and I think these images help to make those connections that 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 what you see on your plate or what you see in a supermarket is just a tiny fraction of the amount of death and suffering that goes on in these places this image you mentioned of the piles of dead piglets, in the in the one hand, this is like pure gross out. We want to gross people out. It, it is, it is disgusting. But on the other hand, like all of these animals are dead, the, their innards are everywhere. Like, what does it matter to the individual? Like, you could be really callous and say, well, like, well, that's a gross picture, but it doesn't really matter. It's you know, death is death. But that's why narratives are important in showing a fuller story. I, I often try not to show one image unless it really can speak for itself and and give a broader picture. So I'd say an image like that doesn't really, but then when you pair it with the images of the piglets inside the farm, their experiences, or the ones that have a botched, um, um, not a vasectomy, uh, what's the, because a vasectomy is like the nice word for what they do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and when they when they remove their balls, in effect, right? You, that's a, a vasectomy. Castration. 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 Yes, you're right. You're right. Castration. You go inside and you photograph these piglets who are shivering from pain and they're recovering from a docked tail and tagged ears and cut teeth and castration, some of which are infected. And then they take the ones who are sick or who have infections and they just, a common practice is to just slam their heads against the ground and leave them there to die. And so we, that's how they end up, you know, in that dumpster, in that dumpster picture. So all of these things need to be known and discussed and narrative and a story and uh, comparisons are really important. It's why there's a lot of work in what we do. Yeah, we want people to show the realities, but we also want to say things like, you know, if you bashed a dog over the head, someone's companion animal, you'd go right to jail. But this is just standard practice in farming. That and worse. There are many, many examples I could I could give. See, it makes me think that maybe the question about objectivity is misplaced because the, the definition you gave about animal photojournalism, it's inherently advocacy work. It's inherently work, as you said, that's trying to affect change. And this brings us nicely to what's supposed to be the kind of theme of the season, which is politics. Now, I think you've given us a good sense here of the kind of visceral nature of these images, the types of stories these images can tie together, the significance of these stories, both for the animals who, who could be saved, but possibly, but also for the kind of change you could affect. Why is this, what kind of change can you affect? And why is that political? I see animal photojournalism as a tool for and in animal advocacy. We are creating strong visuals 
images that are poignant and compelling, but they're also proof. And proof is hard to obtain, and we need it on the political and legal level. We need it on the banners and the placards in marches. We need it on social media. And, and so I really see all of photojournalism as something that furthers animal liberation and animal welfare efforts. And that's why we built We Animals Media as we did. It is a resource to animal advocates everywhere. And it's also a resource to media. They can and should use our images. And, and so it's also why we partner with a lot of NGOs or we get a little tip off from some anonymous source saying, oh, there's this farm, there's this practice, there's a back door open. If we could get some images of this place, then we will run with the story. We will run with a campaign to expose, to press charges, prosecute, or even close a, a farm and also expose a practice. And, and it's really exciting. It's a, doing animal photojournalism is an exciting place to be because you can help initiatives uh, globally. And we do. I have, have lots of examples of, of how we've done so. Could you give us an example? Yes. Let's see which one. The most recent... One was we worked with animal justice here in Canada. You mentioned interviewing Camille Labchuk. And we know that popularity of fur, wearing fur, is, is decreasing in many parts of the world. And here in Canada, there were three remaining fur farms in the province of Quebec. Almost a decade ago, I went to many, many more in Quebec. And I have a, a real invested in interest in like, because I've been to fur farms across Canada, I'm like really passionate about closing them down. And anyway, there are three left in Quebec and we decided to visit all of them and make a big campaign of it. So with animal justice and in the media and with activists and, you know, all sorts of follow-ups and, and so on. And we did so. And as a result of the work that we did one of the farms closed within weeks wow yes one of them closed amazing and i think last i heard the other one is on its way so yeah these pressure campaigns or sometimes legal campaigns do help we obtained images at a fur farm in canada that led to the first criminal prosecution of of a mink farmer because of animal welfare infringements I mean, these images were insane. The amounts of mink that were in each cage, the the kind of feces there, wasn't there some of some of these poor animals? Their claws were kind of growing through the cages. They had like quite bad sores. I hope, yeah, these were, I'm pretty certain these were the farms in Canada. But I remember this campaign. It was a really powerful campaign, and I think mink were quite high in people's imagination because of COVID. There was a lot of kind of mink and the spread of COVID-19. So I don't know if your timing used or mobilized that kind of awareness with mink. Yeah, you're right. And what we try to do is look at, well, what we don't try, what we do is look at the news, look at the hot issues, and then help. Okay, so we, it's clear that more images of avian flu and swine fever and these, I mean, these kinds of hot topics. Zoonotic diseases, right? Yeah. So we know we know that those images are needed. So then we put a call out to our contributing photographers and say, who is where? What can you do? We can give you an assignment or do you have images we can license? And then we put them out to campaigners and to media. So we are quite strategic and we need to be. We need to be providing what's most useful at a given time. So we try to do that. How many photographers do you have working with you at We Animals Media? We have now about 110 contributing photographers. Some of them get regular assignments, and then some of them have just licensed a few images to us and are perhaps on in the early stages of becoming an animal photojournalist. And so we offer mentoring. We have our master class, image critiques, all of, and and community building, all things that will help support APJs grow into doing more and better work and funding. We are not for profit. And we rely on grants and donations to keep people in the field and to run the business and to run the stock platform and do media outreach and, and so on. So it's it's ever strategic. And yes, and, and to the main point about, you know, politics and what we can do, 
I, I can't emphasize enough that we are just a piece of the puzzle, like an essential piece of the puzzle that helps further, you know, the animal conversation globally. I think you helped to bridge kind of imagination, right? That sometimes we think that our imaginations can conjure up the worst kind of violences and stuff. But I think some of these images defy what we think is even happening or was even possible. Didn't you do a couple of, I don't know if you were the photographer, but someone at We Animals Media did a whole host of images of monkeys in Southeast Asia. And didn't this end up leading to some changes in, in CITES? Could you tell us a little bit about that too? Yes. A filmmaker, Carl Ojahovsky, was making a film called Maximum Tolerated Dose about animals used in research. And so I photographed with him as he filmed in several countries. And we did go to Southeast Asia. He posed as a buyer of macaque monkeys. We didn't know how much danger we were in until afterwards, but that's a whole other story. We did manage to photograph at three monkey breeding facilities. That work was done with a group in the UK, and they brought it to the CITES convention in Geneva the following year and presented this dossier of work, which was replete with you know welfare infractions and total obvious cruelty. And they were able to close down two of those three farms. And to this day, because of those efforts and the efforts of, efforts of others, there's still no trade in long-tail macaques in, in, that, in Laos. Incredible. Like, I mean, so this this shows like kind of politics operates at a whole host of different levels. You might have a kind of domestic or national based farm like the mink farm being shut down, but you might also have changes happening to international regulations. Right. And I think these images, like you said, they're part of a puzzle, part of a broader picture. They're part of a broader story. You know, where are these macaques destined for? Why are they being traded and bred in the first place? It's not I would hazard a guess that it's not for Laotians necessarily, they are, macaques are very much used in lab, laboratory sciences and they're shipped across the world. And I don't know if it was the case for these macaques in particular, but this is part of a much bigger story. And I think your photos or the photos of We Animals Media just make the urgency of this politics and the significance and the moral, the, the moral, I don't know what word to put there, but the moral issues of what, what's happening it really just you can't turn away from it. It's there and you can't deny it. And when you're a politician and your job is to look at the facts and there's this photo, I think it really just drives home situations that might seem sterile when you're reading it on a page. Yes. And you mentioned, you know, a, a good quality image that is important. I think what we saw for many decades were, were images shot by someone with a, a point and shoot or not a professional, perhaps an activist who had entered a facility. And for decades, we had images that were shot from human eye vantage point, poor lighting, shot from too far away. Okay, so that has an element of proof, but it doesn't beget the kind of engagement you want with a certain level of professionalism an understanding of lighting and interaction with the animal. I have very basic advice for a lot of photographers. It's almost like disappointingly basic and that's get, get down and get close, you know, stay for a while. Don't stay for 30 seconds. See if you can stay longer. If it's possible, stay for 10 minutes. It's excruciating because you're in front of someone who's, who's suffering or scared, but yeah, get down and get close. And again, don't just show the individual, but show the system they're kept in. And that's the difference between an old school activist picture and something that's that's poignant and moving. And, and there are images, a lot of people can remember images in their lives that that affected them. And we know there are extremely famous images. Borden, the man who was enslaved, uh, he was one of the first people to have the effects of slavery on their body documented his back with all the scars and the lacerations. And that was an image that really galvanized the U S when it was published across the nation. And then there are the images from the Vietnam war, famous images that affected many people. But then if you ask almost anyone, can you remember a photo that affected you in your life? They will have an answer for me. It was a photo in national geographic by Franz Lanting and it's a close-up of a zebra's eye. The zebra is dead, and the zebra has been killed by people who's who you can see in the reflection of the eyeball. 
And so it definitely says something about me as a child. Like I was a child who, who pulled this out of National Geographic and put it on my wall. And you know, other, other people have, you know, nicer things on their walls. But this, this struck me to the extent that I even include that image in presentations that I do like, you know, almost four decades later. It is incredible that you, like there are some iconic images I think that we all, that we all know, right? That, that I think many people know, but kind of to sit and reflect on what images have had a huge impact on your life. Like I think there's a, one of the images and I don't even know who took it or where, but I know one of the images of, of poaching, elephant poaching. And I think that that's something that's fairly commonly photographed but of half the mother's face was missing and it was a mother and a calf and half of her face that her face had been completely hacked and growing up in South Africa right we we kind of we 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 know of elephants we have a reverence for elephants many many of us and I just remember just the, the kind of outrage at how could someone hurt an elephant like that more more recently though kind of positioning animals I I attended a conference last year about animals and tourism and Aaron Gagoski, I'm going to say his name incorrectly, he gave a presentation just showing some of his images and some of the places he'd been to. And again, he kind of, sometimes as academics or scholars, we get really like tripped up with concepts. I mean, this whole concept, this whole podcast is about concepts, right? And I think it's important to think about the words that we use, but sometimes the image can really just crystallize the idea. So you had these images of, of an orangutan in a boxing ring and also of, of, you know, small monkeys having to ride tricycles. And he made a point about dignity, which seems to be this really abstract idea. But what dignity are these animals afforded when they have to get dressed up? Like, And it just, I've got goosebumps now thinking about it. It really, and I think those images will stay with me for life. He had an image of a dolphin in a chlorinated pool that was completely blind. I'm like, wow, it really gives me, it gives me examples as well as a teacher and as a, you know, media person to to call on. And I recall those images much faster than I do necessarily stories I've read. So that says something about me. Yeah. It, images are easy access, aren't they? You can get someone to not only look at, but process an image in a split second where convincing them to read a text, especially as, you know, our attention spans have been shortened. We look at headlines. Perhaps, you know, photojournalism is not dead at all, but it's more important than ever. And kudos to Aaron. He's a dear friend. He's prolific. He's always in the in the field. And for a very long time now, he's been on the front lines with animals. Yeah, it's uh, it's incredible work. Do you have a, like, uh, yeah, this is, I think, extremely exciting. And I, I want to ask, because you mentioned kind of giving advice, if you're interested in doing this type of work, and you mentioned that you've got a masterclass, if someone is a photographer or someone is interested in doing this kind of work or has the skills to kind of contribute to making animals more visible, I'm assuming that the best strategy is not for them to necessarily just pick up their camera and go out there because it is quite dangerous. How can they prepare themselves and learn more about what's required to, to engage in this type of activism and this type of politics? People see what I do, which is more a little more dangerous than what most people will do which is going into places but you don't have to there is animal use on every block of every city there are inhumane callers you can do a story about that you can go to the apartment building in your neighborhood and put up a post about you know you know i i i want to do a photo story of the people here who, you know, keep animals. Do you have canaries? Do you have cats? Do you have lizards? And do a photo story about them. These stories don't have to be against people. We all use animals in different ways. We're just, we just haven't been taught to think from the animal's perspective. It's interesting. It's such a <laughs> I was gonna swear. <laughs> that's that's totally okay. It's such a mind bleep. <laughs> Because, you know, we love animals. We say we love animals, but yeah, we keep them in cages and in tiny little tanks swimming around alone and stuff. But, you know, you can hate the person or you can be curious about it and engage in conversation. And I mentioned the apartment building because this is actually something I want to do. There's an apartment building behind my house. I can hear budgies chirping inside 
that those those apartment buildings in the summer when the windows are open. And I just want to go and say like, hey, tell me about you. Tell me about your budgie. Tell me about your relationship. Can I take photos of this situation? I feel like that's probably one of the most invisible spaces, actually. One of the most difficult spaces is people's homes. Pets have come up never, several times throughout this season. And and I remember speaking to Paula Kari a few a seasons back, and she she had this quote that's kind of stuck with me. She calls animals the wallpaper of our lives. It's so often animals, their lives are just kind of happening, and we, you know, we give them food when they're supposed to have food, or we, but the, the inane boredom. And she speaks about like the, she says we kind of have a tendency of showing the overt violence, but how do you, how do you show the boredom and what goes on in homes where it's a private space? So how do you, how do you capture, how do you capture that? Oh, and that is, a wonderful problem for us to tackle, honestly, because it needs to be. And speaking of that, and I mentioned Carl Oshahovsky earlier, he and I were in a chicken farm once and he set his camera, his video camera on a tripod facing one of tens of thousands of cages in that building, in those buildings. And there were a number of birds stuffed into this one cage and he just set the camera running for one minute. And the challenge is just to look at this, you talked about the boredom or the stresses, the minute to minute that we have absolutely no concept of. So just look at this video for one minute. I tell you, really effective and excruciating. And I probably, you know, probably a lot of people didn't make it through the one, the one minute. So yes, photographing the boredom, find a way to do that, find a way to tell that story. And going back to, you know, you don't have to go to factory farms to to tell these stories. You can go to the local rib fest. You can go to the local butchers and watch people interacting with animal parts and like interview them. There's just just a million things you could do. But what you do have to do if you want to be a good APJ is you have to shoot all the time. You have to practice. You have to be humble. You have to not be attached to your images. And artists are like that. We get really attached to the things that we make. They're important to us. They We put a lot of effort in and, they, and they're meaningful to us. So we need to stand back and look at our work objectively, get it reviewed, and practice, practice, practice. And you will never be a perfect photographer, which might seem daunting to people, but it's actually amazing. You get to learn for the rest of your life on this one, uh, like in your practice, your vocation, whatever, you know, like you get to learn for life. I imagine that's also really gratifying when your kind of profession or your, your hobby even aligns with your ethical commitments, that you're kind of contributing in the ways that you can to, to assist in, in, in situations where we often feel really helpless. Yes. Yes. That's, thank you for saying that. It is hard, daunting, depressing work, but if you're using it for good, if you're making the work available, if you're giving it to activists to use, you know, that's great. And, and you can, you can feel good about that and should feel good about that. And I have a lot of reasons in my work to feel really depressed, but I don't focus on that. I just focused on, I focus on putting, literally focus on putting one foot in front of the other every day and doing my best. And sometimes that's a lot. And sometimes that's not much. Also being vegan. That's something that I do every day when I feel like it's a day where I haven't really contributed much to helping animals. I'm like, okay, well, at least I didn't, didn't harm any animals today in that way. Yeah. And I mean, I think a lot of vegans can attest to, I think when people think about veganism, you know, they think somehow you've given up something and yes, there's a lot of inconvenience and there's a lot of challenges and there's a lot of weird snide underhand comments that you have to contend with. But it's it's so bizarre. It's like it's like I have an allergy, and it's just not an option to me. It's 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 it's, it's, it's there's actually a whole amount of freedom. I don't have the conflict. I don't have the guilt. I don't have any of the kind of knee jerk reactions. There's a there's a odd amount of kind of serenity that comes with just living in line with what you you think. And and this ties back, I think, to the the earlier comment you had about people's defensiveness or resistance to some of these images. Kind of the the knee-jerk reaction. Joanne, do you have a, a quote ready? I know we're, we're approaching that kind of time in the podcast where folks read a, read a quote and perhaps you could tell us the quote and what inspired you to, to share it. Yes. Our last book is called Hidden Animals in the Anthropocene and it's a five-pound tome of proof. Award-winning, gorgeous, very well-done book. Thank you. A historic book on on what is and what should never again be. 
And one of, well, it's going to sound weird because it's such a violent image, but probably one of my favorite images that I've ever taken, favorite because it it, it says so much and it can't it encapsulates so much, is was taken at a Thai slaughterhouse. And it's a vertical image of a worker who is bringing a club down on the head of a pig. The pig is kneeling. Her eyes are closed. She's screaming. And there are other men watching this action. And there's a man holding a bowl and he's holding a knife. So once the pig is clubbed, he will slit her throat and then collect the blood. And it's an action shot. You can see the the ground is full of water and you can see water falling away from the club as it comes down on the head of the pig. So it it says a lot and it's not just about the pig in the picture. I'm, I'm an animal photojournalist, but I am interested in all animals and all of our suffering. And I do know that the workers there were from several other countries who were unpapered and not well paid and would have preferred to do other kinds of work. So the image for me is very much about these these individuals, all of the individuals in the picture. And the images in this book are often accompanied by some kind of text. And this one, I just wanted it to be on its own. I didn't want a picture on the page across from it, but I did want to say something. And I didn't know what, and I thought about it for a long time. And then I actually took a weekend to go through my philosophy books and my books on Buddhism and just find things that inspired me and might possibly accompany this image. And then I went to Shantideva's book about becoming a bodhisattva. So Shantideva was an 8th century Buddhist monk and philosopher, an Indian philosopher, and he, he wrote a very famous book with a very famous quote in it. And I'm going to read you this quote, was, which is in fact part of a very long poem. And it was important for me, no, no, sorry. It made sense for this ancient and wise, these ancient wise and empathetic words to accompany this image. It made sense to me, but also it says how I feel about the world. It's like he's you know speaking on my behalf. And the quote by Shantideva is, May the frightened cease to be afraid and those bound be freed. May the powerless find power and may people think of benefiting each other. For as long as space remains, for as long as sentient beings remain, until then may I too remain to dispel the miseries of the world. Oh, that's beautiful. Oh God, I've got goosebumps everywhere. Because you, you really, that quote really does kind of capture you as the photographer and how you're part of that story and narrative, but also the bounded individuals, bounded to industry and labor that they wouldn't choose for themselves. And of course, the, the pain and suffering of, of the animal who, who ties them together, right? And the, the money, the money, the money shot, unfortunately. Yeah, I think that quote really does just tie, it brings the phot- photographer somehow, you as the photographer into the frame as well, which I think is quite quite beautiful talking about the the laborers and the workers it makes me think a little bit about i don't know if you've read timothy i'm going to say his name incorrectly patch patcherat and just kind of thinking about photojournalism here you know when he discusses politics of sight i think that that's exactly what you're engaged in here that yes there's politics in the kind of traditional sense of changing policies but you're engaged in the, the politics of sight of showing how yeah, how different people and their labor are also connected to different animals and their labor and how often neither those workers nor those animals necessarily made choices on what their life conditions were going to be, right? Yes, that's right. That's exactly right. And it's just like politics. These things are nuanced. Our images should be nuanced. We can show, we can show and do show intentional or abject cruelty, but why are these things happening? are the people in the pictures the actual perpetrators? Are they really? Probably not. So what's going on? What economies are are influencing here? What consumer habits? What cultures and traditions? 
And so there is an endless amount to say on all of these topics. Is there anything else before we before we wrap up? Is there anything else about this kind of relationship between, I guess, activism, animal photojournalism, and politics that you'd you'd like to make sure that we we hear today? We've got it covered, and I, I do want people to really know that we are a resource for the movement and and for the media. We are here to change the world. That's literally what we're doing. <laughs> I've used your stuff, and I think the ways in which your stuff is used is quite interesting. I mean, yes, you could be a traditional media house, you might share it, but I, I used it. I taught a course earlier this year, um, Urban Animal Histories and Geographies, and your images were really useful in helping me, especially the ones from Captive, I think the, the, the project Captive. And one of the things we focused on was called Castral Geographies. And I just showed some of the images from your work, and I contrasted them with some images of, of prisons. And not to not to collapse them with one another, but I was prompting the students to think about how space is used. So they actually didn't know whether there were animals or humans in these different spaces. And then to think about how 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 space is used, like the, the creation of corridors, the the use of particular types of fencing or barbed wire. And what does this say about like keeping animals in? And then to compare the kind of traditional carceral space of a, of a prison or a slaughterhouse or a feeding lot with a zoo. So we're, we're speaking about the politics of sight, but the animal is completely in view. There is, no, there is no getting away from the view of a tourist or someone and how space works differently to kind of hide some animal abuses. But many animal abuse, as you said earlier, is actually plain as day. You walk into a zoo and it's, it's a devastating place. And if we're not seeing the devastation, it's because of of the layout. All right, Joanne, it's been amazing to speak to you today. I've learned a lot about photojournalism. Before we say goodbye, could you tell us a little bit about where people can find out more about We Animals Media and what you're currently working on? Yes. Well, we are a resource to all animal advocates. That's the main thing. We have a stock platform with over 25,000 photos and videos many countries from 110 photographers. So whether you're looking for images on avian flu or you know factory farming or oceans, workers, all these things, you can get that there at weanimalsmedia.org. If you're someone who's interested in learning more about becoming an animal photojournalist, we have a two and a half hour self-guided masterclass also at the same website. And we do image critiques, you know, we build community. We are aiming to normalize animal photojournalism so people can help us do that in many ways. They can also, they can also support We Animals. We are a nonprofit and we rely on grants and donations and that's how we keep people in the field and keep this massive project running. And as to what we have going on, well, speaking of keeping people in the field, we always have assignments on the go. Currently, we just finished a project on foie gras in France. We have created drone imagery and videos over CAFOs in the US. We also have a number of partnerships with NGOs globally, which we always talk about after the work is done and published and and not before. So at any given time, we have people out in the field partnering, shooting, exploring, and trying to make the world a a better place. So that's, that's what we have ongoing. And I think anyone who's part of an NGO should really think, remember that we are a resource, whether it's for an assignment or for using our existing existing images. That's amazing. Do do the NGOs then pay you for, is this like part of the, do they, when it's an assignment, so it's a, a paid assignment? Yeah, good question. Sometimes it is. If they come to us with a project and a budget and they need people to execute the, the frontline work, then great. But we also get funding to do projects and partnerships. So let's say we get a grant for 25000 to do more work in South America, capacity building, so that there are more APJs and more work available on our stock site from that region, then we will use that money. Then we will call NGOs or activists and say, hey, what are you working on? Do you need help? Can we partner? And then, and then they have those images available for their use. And we make everything that we shoot available for, for everyone uh, free of charge, in fact. 
Yeah, your model is incredible. I love that someone like me can access the images. And I know that you've got options for, you know, proper media houses to pay for the images to help, like you said, strategy, strategy, strategy. And uh, I think you've got an incredible kind of hybrid model that's that's sustainable. I hope uh, it looks good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So far, it's sustainable. And and we're learning. You know, I, I didn't set out to grow up and be the founder of a photo agency. It's kind of fly by the seat of our pants, but we have 13 or 14 staff, you know, with amazing expertise, be it in media or operations and running a stock platform and and so on. People are right to assume that most of our content is really difficult and challenging material of animal suffering globally. It is. However, we also have tons of images of stories of change and hope and rescue and love and compassion. We have shot at sanctuaries globally. We had our Unbound project, which featured women on the front lines of animal advocacy globally. And over the course of seven years, we featured over 150 women who are badasses out there. And some of them have been on your podcast, Eva Meyer. I'm sure Gladys Kalema Zikosoka must have been there. She's a, She's so cool. She's so cool. The work she does. Yeah. And she's just so warm. Yeah. That's such a cool project. We do plan on doing a lot more stories of change in progress. We have wrapped the Unbound project, and so we want to replace it with something that needs a really good name. We haven't come up with a name yet, so right now we just call it Stories of Change in Progress, and that focuses on every kind of animal advocacy. We want to inspire people, and part of why I became who I became was because I looked up to people like Jane Goodall. And I saw, wow, look at her life. I want a life like that. And so we want to show people ideas and careers and technology that inspire them to go in those directions as well. I love that. What a great note to end on. And I think, like you said, this is part of animal stories as well, right? There are stories of triumph. There are stories of resilience. I spoke to Hope uh, Fredosian, Fredosian, not too long ago about like the concept of phoenix zones and that if given a chance, animals can be resilient. They can survive. They have stories and worlds and there are sanctuaries where there are different opportunities. There are different ways in which space and relations can be. And I think, yeah, thank you just so much for for the work you do. You're an inspiration. And I've really, really had fun talking to you today. It's been such a pleasure. And thank you. And hopefully we'll speak again. And I'm really enjoying your podcast. So keep it up. I look forward to the next. Virginia, it's good to have you back on the show. It's really good to be back. It feels like a long time this time for some reason. Yeah, it's been it's been a spot of time, but we're nearing the end. I can't believe that we're so close to the end of the season. And this episode was really wonderful. I, I very much enjoyed speaking to Joanne. Her, her photography is unbelievable. So I, I believe you've got something in line with Joanne's episode in store for us. Yeah, absolutely. I really enjoyed looking at them. And Joanne's striking photographs of mink on fur farms are the reason I'm highlighting them in this episode. And even though in themselves, Joanne's images are confronting and even repellent, the beauty of the mink stands out and transcends their squalid surroundings. And even though I'm imposing anthropocentric standards of aesthetics onto animals, mink really are beautiful. They're they're in the same family as otters and stoats, They have the same long, live bodies, the same grace and speed, and they have facial proportions which people find endearing because of their cute attributes. There are two kinds of mink, the American and the European. The IUCN classifies the European mink as critically endangered, but the American mink as of least concern. It's the American mink I'm focusing on because they're the ones found in fur farms. In fact, the American mink has the unenviable record of being the animal most farmed for their fur. But let me tell you about mink in the wild before I get onto fur farming. Mink are described as semi-aquatic. They always live close to water, and even when they're moving around a landscape, they tend to follow water lines. They have webbed feet, which makes them excellent swimmers, but they're just at home on landers in the water, and they can borrow and climb as well as swim. So they're really adaptable little animals, and they're also really self-reliant, being entirely solitary as adults except for mating. Because they're solitary, mink in the wild rarely meet each other, so they communicate mostly through scent, leaving chemical messages to mark their territory or to find a mate. 
They also vocalize though, and they purr when they're content in the same way as cats do. Let me contrast this with the experience of mink on fur farms. On fur farms, mink are kept in battery cages, usually with other mink and with no access to water to swim in. Remember, they're semi-aquatic, solitary animals, so being deprived of the opportunity to swim and being caged with others is detrimental to their well-being. When kept in such conditions, mink can become aggressive, even harming or killing each other. One of Joanne's photographs captures this poignantly. The image is called Life and Death in Fur Farming and was awarded highly commended in Wildlife Photographer of the Year in 2022. It's an image of mink crowded into a wire battery cage. The mink looks sleek and grey and impossibly clean despite the squalor of their surroundings. A handwritten sign above the cage indicates how many mink are in it. The original number, 10, has been crossed out and replaced by the number 8 scrawled in a different colour pen. It still seems an impossible number. If you try, you can count perhaps 6 mink, leaving you to assume that the other two are squeezed into a corner somewhere because the cage is too small even for one mink. The image captures the casual and brutal attitude to life and death of the mink on, caught up in fur farming. In your interview, Joanne said that animal photojournalism strives to show individual animals and the systems they're in. And I think this image does exactly that. Animal photojournalism often portrays individual animals like mink with care and sensitivity, while also highlighting concerns regarding the systems they're in, like fur farms. As a lay observer, I can see that in Joanne's photographs of mink in fur farms. She captures the character and essence of the mink while framing them within the harsh and brutal reality of fur farming, consciously exposing the dirt, disease, decay and death involved. There's an incredible pathos to the images. They evoke deep pity for the mink and also incredible sadness that fur farming can go on. There's also a horrible irony that the mink's incredible fur, which is so valuable to them for its denseness and waterproofness, is also valued by people. People take beautiful animals and subject them to the almost unimaginably ugly process of fur farming to produce something which is considered beautiful or fashionable. It's worth talking a little bit about the wider issues in relation to mink fur farming and anti-fur campaigning. Human-animal environment relations are utterly entangled in fur farming and even anti-fur campaigning. This means that they have effects on animal environmental and human health. So we can think about them from a One Health perspective. Mink are adept at escaping from fur farms, and they're also released by anti-fur activists. In fact, in Denmark, which used to be the world's largest producer of mink fur, it was thought that most free-living mink were escapees from farms. And because they're so adaptable, mink who escape or are released can have significant impacts on the ecosystems they enter, to the point that they're sometimes classified as an invasive species. The pollution from fur farms also has a significant impact on the environment, contaminating waterways and affecting aquatic life. Eutrophication and persistent organic pollutants have both been associated with fur farming in Nova Scotia and Canada. And lastly, as the COVID-19 pandemic demonstrated, diseases can be passed between humans and mink. The transmission of COVID-19 from people to mink and mink to people resulted in the death of millions of mink. 17 million in Denmark alone, as they were killed as part of attempts to control COVID-19. So as with many other cases of human-animal relations, it's worth thinking about the bigger picture when we think about fur farming. Mink fur, with its dense undercoat and long waterproof outer coat, which make mink so well adapted to their ecological niche, might be prized by people. But there's much more than just fashion at stake when we exploit mink for their fur. A mink fur coat might cost around £8,000, but the true cost of the coat includes the environmental and ethical cost as well. Wow, that was really powerful. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, I found Joanne's photographs really powerful. So, you know, that I was really thinking about that when I was researching this highlight. Yeah, the whole series, because there's there's several images there of mink farming and just they're so dark and, like you say, several animals squeezed and crammed into tiny cages and animals that are really quite uh, solitary, don't enjoy being near others, let alone crammed into a cage where you can't leave. 
And you know, that, that the capacity and that desire to leave and to get away and you can't, right, will often result, I think, in, in you know, even more aggressive animals in the cage, harming those that are perhaps more timid. Yeah, just absolutely awful conditions. But those images really do capture kind of what's at stake for those mink. Well, they, I mean, that's what animal photojournalism does, isn't it? That's, that's what Joanne was saying. Yeah, and, and but I also really appreciate yeah, how you kind of unfurled fur farming because I think so often even us as uh, folks that are interested in animal rights or animal welfare, you know, we'll focus on how this results in massive harm, cruelty, death for the animals involved, but actually the, the effects of fur farming and of the exploitation of these animals are far-reaching. Like you say, there are now animals going into ecosystems that they can disrupt, there's massive pollution, there's there's... Yeah, it, it just kind of, is it centrifugal that goes outwards or is it centrifugal that goes, I think it's centrifugal. I'm going to go with centrifugal. I think the centrifugal, you know, effects of fur farming and of any sort of farming are, are pretty intense. So thank you so much. That was amazing. Thank you. Thank you to Christian Mentz for editing this episode. Thank you also to Animals in Philosophy, Politics, Law and Ethics, Apple for sponsoring this podcast, to Jeremy John for the logo and Gordon Clark for the bed music. Thank you also goes to Virginia Thomas for her work with the Animal Highlight. This is The Animal Turn with me. Claudia Hurtenfelder. For more great iRaw podcasts, visit iRawPod.com. That's I-R-O-A-R-P-O-D.com.